Well, good evening, Olive Branch. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. He, uh, he loves imperfection. And actually, that's going to tie into uh, our study tonight. <laughs> so we have an application already. Uh, let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this evening. We thank you for every soul in here. We, we just love you, Lord. We thank you so much for your word. Uh, may we acknowledge you and glorify you and worship you in all things. We would be lost without your word, Lord. And uh, I ask that you would touch each of us individually this evening. Um, this study can be poignant. And yet, Lord, help us to have ears that are open and eyes that are open to uh, what you have to say to our hearts. Again, I thank you for this day. And I ask uh, a special uh, blessing and a hedge about the uh, Bobian family as they're traveling and taking some time off and relaxing. And, they don't take time off from you, Lord. You know that. But just to get away and spend family time and quality time in your name. And may we do the same here at this fellowship. Understand that we are family. And it is a blessing to be able to be up here and um, be entrusted by your people to say the truth. Nothing more and nothing less. And uh, we love you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So everybody has... Your list of texts, right? Yeah. Being that we are going to probably be two hours late this evening, so if you want to guess, no. Um, in Judges 3 8, I'm going to give a little bit of background again, I'll cut it a little shorter. For those of you who have been here for the previous two studies that I have given in Judges, um, they were somewhat lengthy, again. Uh, we started out in Judges 1, 2 through 5, and we, we touched on and we really hit on compromise. And we've seen that compromise coming in through uh, the people of Israel, um, how they turn their back upon God. After all of those wondrous works that he's done, and I'm still trying to have us put ourselves in the same position, right? Um, that we too, we see all of God's miraculous works individually. We've seen, we can look back in our own lives personally and see where he's taken us and where he's brought us. And um, that valleys that we've been in, I talked about, and the hills that we've been on, and that's going to continue through this lifetime. We're sojourners here, and uh, we're just going to honor and praise the Lord in all that we do. And at times, you know, we neglect him. And he gives us a, a short rope. Eventually, he's going to chastise those whom he loves, and he's going to pull back. And throughout the book of Judges, as I've been studying it, I definitely see God's mercy upon his people. And all they have to do is just repent, turn to him, seek his face out, pray and humble themselves. And he's right there. He's always there. And uh, honestly, I, I started Judges 3 about a month ago. And up until last week, I was on my third series of how I thought the Lord wanted me to present what he had to say there. And initially, I'd be, I was guilty of saying, you know what, Lord, I don't know if there's a whole lot here for me to speak on other than uh, just reading through your word. And that's awesome. And that's what we should be doing. Um, you know, it's been quoted. It's simple to read God's word. And right what comes to mind is Ezra and Nehemiah when they got out of captivity. And all the people of Israel were with them by the temple. And all they did was read God's law. They didn't understand Hebrew yet, so they taught in Aramaic because they came out of the captivity. They made them understand godly men. And those representatives was the second study we went through <coughs> about carrying on generational studies, keeping our families, the people we know, the young people, in the Word of God and abiding by it, not just talking a good story and playing church and religiosity and all those things that shine in front of them, but teaching them the Word of God. And all you have to do is read it. And we have to allow God's Word to do the work, and not me, and not anybody else. And the power of the Word is there, right? This is a reminder, let's turn to Hebrews. Quick, Hebrews 4, right? We know we're going on that. All right, Hebrews 4, 12, and 13. For the word of God is living 
and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of the soul and spirit, and joints and marrow, and the discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open under the eyes of him whom we must give an account. So God's word is powerful. I can't make it any more than it is. No one can. We need to just be in it. And it's a privilege. It's an honor and a great responsibility to read his word and allow him, the Holy Spirit, to touch your hearts as we as go through it. And your devotion times, you know, all those times. Um, I know I'm not the only one where you have sleepless nights and you wake up when you're praying for days, weeks, maybe just a day, and you can't sleep. And there's a verse that's in your mind all of a sudden. You know, I've tried going back to sleep and it does not work. So I get up and I actually physically go look in God's Word and it's like, you know what? I'm so glad I did that on so many occasions because those directions that I'm looking for and I'm striving so hard in my own flesh to find, He's got it right here. And all I have to do is be listening for that calling. I can't sleep, big deal, right? Um, we're going to be in Esther tonight for a little bit. And you know what happened with Hazarus? He couldn't sleep one night. And he, he got the book of the records of the Persian uh, Empire. But through that, we're going to touch on Mordecai. There's a couple of gentlemen I'll talk, I'll talk about Mordecai this evening, about his faithfulness and how he's brought up. He was born in Sushan. Um, his family was taken away captive out of Babylon. And also, uh, if we have enough time, I'd like to touch on a little bit of the profile of D.L. Moody. And it's really interesting. I, I would encourage you to check out the complete story of, of his life and uh, how he was faithful. And I didn't understand a lot of it, you know, where he came from, and how he trusted the Lord in a lot of situations, in all situations that I had read on him. But um, just answering that call is what we wanted to do. And that's what we always want to do. Um, so we went through uh, the representatives, passing down God's word to the next generation. So going back to Joshua, to give us more familiarity with uh, the book of Judges. Joshua chapter 23. Verses 1 through 13. And I have switched for you. I'm on an old King Jimmy. I'm on a new King James for you. So uh, I heard some, uh, some people saying they're having a hard time keeping up. The verses uh, context are a little switched around. So I'll be reading on New King James, but my studies are still Old King James. Uh, I think my personal opinion is it's closer to the original text. <coughs> but there's a, lot, there's a lot to say about that, the men that put that together. Again, Jeremiah 23, 1 through 13. Now it came to pass a long time after the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies round about that Joshua was old, advanced in age. And Joshua called for all Israel, for all the elders, for all their heads, for all their judges, and for their officers, and said that I am old, advanced in age. Happy birthday. <laughs> I just keep in mind. I won't mention names. See, I have divided you by a lot of these nations that remain to be inheritance for your tribes from Jordan, with all the nations that I have cut off as far as the great sea westward. And the Lord your God will expel them from before you, and drive them out from your sight, so you shall possess their land, as the Lord your God promised you. Therefore, be very courageous to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. Lest you turn aside from it, to the right hand or to the left, and lest you go among these nations, these who remain among you, you shall not make mention of the name of their gods, nor cause anyone to swear by them. You shall not serve them, nor bow down to them. But you shall hold fast to the Lord your God, as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out from before you great and strong nations, but as for you, no one has been able to stand against you to this day. One man of you shall chase a thousand, for the Lord your God is he who fights for you. He has promised you. Therefore, take careful heed to yourselves that you love the Lord your God. Or else, if indeed you do go back and cling to the remnant of these nations, these that remain among you and make marriages with them and go into them, and they to you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations from before you, 
But there shall be a snare, they shall be a snare and trap to you, and scour scourges on your sides, and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God has given you. So that's a reference before Judges starts. And I, I read that before, and it gives us a good backdrop. We know that within the compromise and with the, the lack of passing down this knowledge, which Joshua just did here with all the elders, the officers, to continue that on, if we don't have that, it, it falls, falls short. And if it falls short, who's going to pick it up? We can't expect society to do it. Right? We can't expect unbelievers to do it. They're not going to. So it takes a lot of responsibility, especially within families. So, representatives, we have a serving to represent somebody standing or acting for another, especially through a delegated authority. God's word is relevant and always has been and always will be. Um, the more we spruce it up or imply our thoughts, impose our thoughts to God's word, um, he doesn't want to work through you. He doesn't want to work through those works. He wants to work through what he said he wants to do. Um, as we read in Judges' first chapter, he gave him a little bit of a rope. Uh, he told the uh, tribe of Judah to go take the Canaanites. And they said, yeah, okay, but I'm going to take my brother Simeon. That's not what the Lord said, right? So that slippery slope we touched on earlier, it starts small and it builds because you see that you get away with a little bit and the Lord gives you that rope. And you think you have successes in areas that are honoring him, but you're really not honoring him. You're thinking to yourself that I can do this alone. That's how he's letting you do that. Until you come to the end of yourself and we can relate to that personally. I can until I came to the end of myself, I didn't realize what the Lord could do because I was doing it in my own strength. As an unbeliever and even as a new Christian, I was testing him always, always testing him. And um, here I am today standing up here presenting the Word of God. I would have never seen that 20 years ago. And we all have stories like that. Churchianity, lip service, I had all that. I was in the end group. I said the right words, did the right motions, did all that. And I think that was more dangerous um, than being an unbeliever, is uh, playing church. And um, I hit on that a lot, and I think we have a huge mission field within the walls of the church. And if the foundations are gone, what good is it? We need to build within our church family, and then go out, and then make disciples. And we praise the Lord through that. We have to honor Him. If my people call me, or my people call by my name, right? Shall humble themselves, seek my face, pray. Then I will from heaven hear their prayer, forgive their sin, and heal their land. So He has an ob there's an obligation here for us to do that, to turn. There's many verses about God hearkening unto prayer. It means we have to get right with our Lord. You can put up a lot of prayers and they're only going to the ceiling. If you're not right with the Lord, he's not hearkening. That means we're not in his will. We want to see what his will has got to do in our lives. The people of Israel, this was a good example for all of us to take note. Now, Judges 3, 8 through uh, 31. I'll read the text. Therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan the Rishaitim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Cushan the Rishaitim eight years. When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer. For the children of Israel who delivered them, Othniel the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord delivered Cushan Rishayatim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishayatim. So the land had rest for forty years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. 
So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel because he had done evil in the sight of the Lord. Oh, they have done evil in the sight of the Lord. Then he gathered to himself the people of Ammon, Amalek, went to feed Israel, and took possessions of the city of Palms. So the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years. But when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, the left-handed man. By him the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. <coughs> now Ehud made himself a dagger. It was a double-edged and cubit in length. and fastened it to under his clothes on his right thigh. So he brought the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. But he himself turned back from the stone images that were at Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he said, Keep silence. And all who attended him went out from him. So Ehud came to him. Now he was sitting upstairs in this cool private chamber. Then Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. So he arose from his seat. Then Ehud reached his left hand took the dagger from his right thigh, thrust it into his belly, even to hilt, went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not draw the dagger out of his belly, and his entrails came out. Then Ehud went out through the porch and shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. And when he had gone out, Eglon's servants came to look, and to their surprise, the doors of the upper room were locked. So they said, he is probably attending to his needs in the cool chamber. So they waited until they were embarrassed, but still he had not opened the doors of the upper room. Therefore they took the key and opened them, and there was their master, fallen dead on the floor. But Ehud had escaped while they delayed and passed beyond the stone images and escaped to Sirah. And then happened, when he arrived, that he blew the trumpet in the mountains of Ephraim, and the children of Israel went down with him to the mountains, and he led them. And he said to them, Follow me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him, seized the fords of Jordan, cleaving the Moab, and did not allow anyone to cross. And at that time they killed about 10,000 men of Moab, all stout men of valor. Not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. After him, Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. So the anger of the Lord was hot, in verse 8. Why? Well, we can read that in Exodus 34, 15. Um, and Deuteronomy, let's go to Deuteronomy 17. I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 7. Why the anger of the Lord was hot. We read some of that in the Gospel of Fire, but back in Moses' uh, day, let's see what the Lord had to say to uh, the people of Israel through Moses. Chapter 7, 1 through 4. When the Lord your God brings you into the land which you go to possess and has cast out many nations before you, the Hittites, the Gerasites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than you. When the Lord your God delivers them over to you, you shall conquer them, utterly destroy them. You shall not make a covenant with them, nor show mercy to them. Nor shall you make marriages with them. You shall not give your daughter to their son, nor take their daughter for your son. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. So the anger of the Lord will be aroused against you and destroy you suddenly. He told them flat out what he would do when they get there. And I'm not pointing the finger at Israel because a lot of times I think it comes right back. And it was very convicting for this month of study with just one chapter of Judges. Mm -hmm. um, trying to figure out what I should say and how to say it can be complicated at times. Um, but I'm going to let the Word of God do the conviction. In chapter 3, uh, 1 through 4, we have read that God left these nations a test to prove Israel so as to teach them how to work. In Exodus 23, 20 through 33 states, a little and a little God would drive out the pagan nations that exist in the land. 
He alerted them to the coming test that would happen if they would not follow him. And he also told them, little by little. It's always a test of faith because if it was done all at once, they think, oh, miraculous that we had something to do with it. And no more tests. You can see how the enemy of um, contentment is comfort. It's two different things. We think they tie together, but they're not. Because in comfort, we lose what contentment is. Knowing God and who he is is all the contentment we need, really. But the comforts really seem nice, right? It's that slippery slope again. And it all comes from his hands. We don't acknowledge it. We don't give it back to him. He's going to take it away from us suddenly. Here, he's telling them flat out that these people in these lands are going to take us slowly before you as a test, as a proving ground for who you are. It hasn't been easy for these people. You've got to look back all the way into slavery in Egypt. And how they came through the wilderness wanderings and, you know, uh, Jacob and Caleb going into the land and saying, hey, we can take these guys. And the rest saying, no, we can't. 40 years of wandering. And they perished. So Joshua came up to uh, the land of Jericho, by Jericho, and they crossed the Jordan. And they hadn't been circumcised. All those, that period when Moses says on the eighth day, must circumcise your young ones. They forgot the Lord even in those wanderings. So they had, in Gilgal, was the rolling away. Where the covenant between Israel and God was reestablished by mass circumcising of the children of the wanderings of which the leaders of Israel neglected in the wilderness to be a sign unto them. Abrahamic sign. Circumcision. God's given a sign for the Noahic sign, the rainbow. The Mosaic sign is the Shabbat. Abrahamic sign. Circumcision. Davidic sign is a virgin birth. The sign of the New Testament is what? Jesus' blood. And therein lies the grace. That's the sign of the New Testament. Take eat, this is my body, take drink, this is my blood. So that sign they had forgot. They neglected it. That's the second time that happened. Remember back when Moses left the land of Midian? His wife got a little upset about that. If you're going to go do the work of the Lord, aren't you supposed to honor the Lord? And he did. So they are rolling away which what Gilgal means. His promise of the land of provision for all things to them would not fail. So Exodus 23, 20 through 23. Let's turn there quick. 23. 20 to 23. I'm going to touch on, so we see... Uh, his promise of his angel will go before them. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him. Obey his voice. Do not provoke him. For he will not pardon your transgressions, for thy name is in him. That's very specific. We know exactly who that. That's a Christophany. That's our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, who led the way before the enemies. As we read through this chapter 3, God didn't need Ehud, Shamgar, Othniel to do his work. He wanted them to prove that he was near and close, right? If we think back to Hezekiah's day, who was outside the city of Jerusalem at the time and he was praying? Who took care of 185,000 Assyrians in one night? It was our Lord Jesus. The angel of the Lord, the Malach, the anointed one, did it in one night. He doesn't need anybody to do it. He wants us to do that, to honor him, give him glory. If you think back, when they were leaving Egypt, what did he kept telling um, Aaron and Moses? This is so I wouldn't give glory. Ten plagues upon Egypt. I will show you my glory. And that is the will of the Father. To always be glorified in all things. We think, well, how can he use wickedness to receive glory? Because the Lord is sovereign. Psalm 139 says he doesn't love everybody. Psalm 139 says he hates the wicked, the workers of unrighteousness. And he already knows who that is. 
is not bound by time like we are. This is ex existing now, the present, the future, and the past, all at the same time. He knows the hearts of every man that was, will be, and is now. He uses that. He doesn't... Sometimes we get hung up on that situation like, well, he changed their heart. He already knows the outcome of what their heart's going to be, their span of their life. He uses that in the course of history. I know it blows your brain, doesn't it? You think about it. He hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, why did he do that? Because he already knew how Pharaoh was going to respond to the Lord God of Israel. Not in that moment, the span of Pharaoh's life. He doesn't change. He's, we still have that free will. But he knows that free will, he uses it in the course of history. We are to do. We are to go out, spread the gospel, and honor our Lord. We don't know what heart it falls on. The four soils, one out of the four is saved. We don't know that. We're just going to do. That's what he wants us to do. And that way we honor him. We can preach and talk, sit on a soapbox in the corner, and no one responds. Except one. And you don't even know. And I pray that when I'm witnessing that I don't find out. Because I don't want to have taken the glory. Somewhere along the lines, I say, you know what? I did that. I did not do that. I took the courage as these people took the courage because they had faith in God. The Holy Spirit was put upon them to do the work. I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He indwells me. I can yield to that spirit, or I can say not today. I can say not tomorrow. He's going to eat at me, though. That conviction is going to wear me down. It has. <laughs> I fought against it. I still do at times. Because I want to have a little recognition. We all want a little recognition. I don't, know. I don't even want thanks at times because, you know, it may mean well from somebody's heart. But it lands on this part. <laughs> and if I push it off, it'll come back. That's hard to do, is it not, church? It's uh, to be faithful unto our God and just give him all the glory. That's why we worship him the way we do, uh, the way we should. <clears throat> Without technology in our hearts, we're singing unto the Lord. And I like this. I really do. I like the imperfectness. Because that's all of our hearts that come through that door. It's imperfectness. I love it. I praise the Lord for that, because if we were all rigid and following everything that was on our screens, and everything went great, we walk out the door and say, hey, I can't wait for the next day. Today is enough trouble for today. Let's just focus on today. And that's what these gentlemen did. Look, and they gave them rest. God gave them rest. After just being faithful to all they called him, called them to war, to his sword, uh, an ox goalie? Really? 600 people? You know what an ox goalie looks like? Six to eight foot long rod. Wooden. One end it's pointed, sometimes it was brazen, sometimes it was a sharpened stick. And the other end there was either a metal spade or wooden spade to clean the plow off. Farming implement. 600 trained men of war, Chandler, took care and delivered Israel. He didn't do that on his own. Some of the best trained warriors ever were the Roman warriors. The two men were able, trained, to defend a 16 square foot area for 50 men. 50. Two men. Shamgar with an ox goat. That's towards the end of our study tonight. But I'm just pointing at the power of the Holy Spirit. When he rests upon somebody and you allow him and you yield to him without any care, and we're going to find that in Esther and Mordecai, he can do great works. And if we don't see it, praise the Lord. Let somebody else see it. We want to take as many men and women and children as we can to heaven with us. And I don't need to see the results. That field is ripe for the picking. That's fine. I'll just put them in the basket and let God sort them out. He's done that with my heart, and uh, I'm very thankful. Right? Grace and mercy extends to all. And there go I, but by the grace of God, as um, Bunyan used to write, right? <laughs> uh, praise the Lord. Did I read Jeremiah 23? <laughs> Did I read it? I get off on a tangent on that. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep the way to bring you the place which you prepare 
Beware of him, obey his voice, do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. But if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the Amorites and the Hittites and Perizzites and Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. God did it. God did with Eglon. God did it with Nebuchadnezzar. He warned the people. He warns us. You know, we know exactly what he's going to do, maybe not the timing or who, but he's using other people. He's using unbelievers to form and refine his church right now. And he's actually using the church to refine his own church right now. It's beautiful. It really is. The refiner's fire. And we find that through the course of history. Verses 9 through 11, we see God's mercy in his sovereign hand in all of human history and personified in his faithfulness to his people Israel, raising up a judge, or have you a deliverer, to enforce and proclaim God's precepts, commands. Notice, he used a person to fulfill his delivering, not the many or the masses. Othniel, Caleb's younger brother, had been steeped in the ways of God and proved himself obedient and trusting in the Lord's word. That representative in the family again. Joshua, Bailey. Being brought up in a godly family, seeing the power of the hand or behind those who God employs to do his bidding, the power of God's enabling uh, enablements through his spirit. The people as a whole repented and cried unto the God, unto God, meaning the whole culture became aware of their disobedience and sought out the Lord for deliverance. Can you picture that? Read that again. The, the people became aware of their disobedience and sought out the Lord for deliverance from the oppression of the surrounding nations, of whom God himself strengthened and brought to judge and test. Judges 3 4. And they were left that he might test Israel by them to know whether they would obey the commandment of the Lord which he had commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. A little side note or thought, ever wonder how, where, or who started to beseech the Lord for his mercy? You can run through that text and you think, yeah, the people came to him. You ever wonder how that started? The text states, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, and others thought it good for the hope that could deliver. And the whole people came together in a repentance and mourning, allowing people to come to the end of themselves in their own efforts, denying their abilities to exist in the land God promised them, and claiming self-dependency as the rule of the land, which in turn leads to compromise and assimilation with culture and denying the God that brought them and bought them. We can assimilate really easy in our culture today. That's how relevant this is. You know, God's word is always relevant. We don't have to, to touch it up. It is so contemporary as we read through it. Uh, in his mercy, he delivers us because he is faithful. We are not. We have faith in a great God. That is where faith lies. Faith the size of a mustard seed in our own efforts? No. The size of a mustard seed in a great God. Our Lord Jesus. That's where our faith lies. He's doing the work. We're not. <laughs> he wants us to do it because we want that relationship with him. We can call him out of Father by that means. He's looking for it. He's seeking it out. Ehud was another man raised up by God with a physical advantage for battle. Though a minor reference in Scripture, a trait that God used for just this such a time as this. In combat, the seemingly small difference can lead to a huge result in the outcome. Obviously, God could have used anyone for this task, yet he used the one who had faith in God's calling and willingness to serve. Turn to Esther chapter 4, please. Willingness to serve. Chapter 4, verse 10, all the way through 5, 2. You see another deliverer that was faithful, even to the death if it were to come. And God moved King Ahasuerus 
to listen to her request and later acted on the petitions of Mordecai. 4.10, then Esther spoke to Hephash and gave him a command for Mordecai. And all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court of the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go in to see the king these 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. And Mordecai told them the answer to Esther. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. God will use someone else. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you may have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them and replied to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan, Shushan and fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. Now it happened on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace, across from the king's house, while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house, facing the entrance of the house. So it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, that she found favor in his sight, and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter. You know who's touching the top of the scepter for us right now? It's the one who died for us, sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding daily for the brethren. How wonderful is that? Praise the Lord. We need that. In his mercy, he delivers because he's faithful and fulfill his word, and he uses people to accomplish it. I'd like to read to you a little bit about Mordecai here. A little profile here from my study Bible, and I thought it fitting that we can place this man in our lives. He is a man that was born in Shushan. Like I said, his family had been taken captive um, <coughs> prior to the last invasion of Nebuchadnezzar, probably the second invasion. So over 100 years before the book was written. Following Jerusalem's last stand against Nebuchadnezzar, Mordecai's family was deported to the Babylon Empire. He was probably born in Shushan, the city that became one of Persia's capitals after Cyrus conquered Babylon, and inherited an official position among the Jewish captives that kept him around in the palace, even after Babylonians had driven off. At one time, when he overheard plans to assassinate Ahasuerus, he reported the plot and saved the king's life. Mordecai's life was filled with challenges that he turned to opportunities. When his aunt and uncle died, he adopted Esther, her daughter and his young cousin, probably because his own parents were dead and he felt responsible for her. Later, when she was drafted into Ahasuerus' harem and chose to be queen, chosen to be queen, Mordecai continued to advise her. Shortly after this, he found himself in conflict with Ahasuerus' Recently appointed Prime Minister, Haman, the wicked Haman. Although willing to serve the king, Mordecai refused to worship the king's representative. Haman was furious with Mordecai, so he planned to have Mordecai and all the Jews killed. His plan became a law of the Medes and Persians, and it looked as though the Jews were doomed. Mordecai, willing to be God's servant wherever he was, responded to be by contacting Esther and telling her that one reason God had allowed her to be queen might well be to save her people from this threat. But God had also placed him in the right place years earlier. God revealed to the king through his nighttime reading of historical documents that Mordecai had once saved his life, and the king realized he had never thanked Mordecai. The great honor then given to Mordecai ruined Haman's plan to hang him on the gallows. God had woven an effective counter-strategy against which Haman's plan could not stand. 
Later, Mordecai instituted the Jewish Feast of Purim. He had a lengthy career of service to the king on behalf of the Jews. In Mordecai's life, God blended both character and circumstances to accomplish great things. He has not changed the way he works. God is using the situation you face, I face each day, to weave a pattern of godliness into our character. Pause and ask God to help you to respond appropriately to the situations you find yourself in today. You have to reflect on those things that God has placed in your life. A lot of heartache, I know. And I think we give more of God, our attention to God when we're in those heartache moments. So God preserved Israel, as we read in Mordecai, with Mordecai and Esther. He's always willing to preserve his people. Isaiah 41, 8 through 11, God preserves his people, Israel. I'm going to honor Israel this week. This is a week 54 years ago. Six-day war, they took the old city of Jerusalem this week. It's an amazing battle. All of the battles are. You can see God's hand in it. But just take some time and check it out. It's just truly amazing how they overcame the Jordanian army and all those that supported them. Uh, praise God for it, and he did it. The Jewish people did not do it. He brought them in the land. He brought them in the land in unbelief. That's fulfilled prophecy. We are close, people. 130 countries are represented in, in the nation of Israel right now. Jews coming back to the land. It's close. Temple Mount, it's a ticking hand. It's got the minute hand of Jerusalem. We have to pay attention. Eschatology, the prophetic plan of God is extremely important. We need to use it. It's over a quarter of the Bible, mainly pointing to the Messiah, but also eschatology. We need to use that in our own lives to show us up for hope, but also to be beacons unto the people that don't understand. The prophetic word of God, that's how he proves he's got truth. It's prophecy. All the grace and love and mercy and all that that is abiding in his great name, it's all prophetic. And we need to use it in our witnessing. Not pointing down and all that tactfulness, right? Gentle as doves, wise as serpents. But we know, we're watching Jerusalem right now, and I would say my eyes are really close on Damascus too, right now. And we know in Isaiah, that hasn't been fulfilled, Isaiah 17, correct? That it's going to be a ruin to see if there will not be any dwellers there. We see that happen in our lifetime. Church, the tribulation is fastly approaching, and so is the rapture of the church. And with that, we don't want to leave anybody behind because I can't guarantee anybody that I know that has not accepted as Jesus as Savior right now would be willing to give their lives then, but they're not willing to give their lives now. In those comforts I was talking about, if you're going to be put to death, beheaded, because of your faith in the Lord Jesus, are you willing to do that later? Why put it off? God's going to send strong delusion to believe the lie. And God does something that's going to be accomplished. There's no way around it. And I picture in my head, it helped me to witness people in my family that are going to be in delusion. Then they're starting. I mean, we're getting molded to that right now as a society. <laughs> Isaiah 41.8 But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. Thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, and called thee from the chief men thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant. I have chosen thee, and cast not thee away. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Behold, all they that are in, uh, incensed against thee shall be ashamed and humbled. <coughs> they shall be as nothing, and they that strive with thee shall perish. God preserves his people. 2,700 years he's preserved his people. You think back to the Assyrian captivity, 722 B.C., there's a small dispersion of people then, right? The northern tribes, ten of them. 
27, over 2,700 years ago. And he's brought his people, prophetically speaking, to know that his word is true. We have to know prophecy to weigh it up. Is God really speaking the truth there? Is this prophet speaking the truth? It's happened. Like I said, over 130 countries represented in, in Israel today. In unbelief. In Zechariah 12 and 13, which Lord willing will cover, we know that only a third are not going to perish. They're going to understand. Two thirds are going to perish in the tribulation period. The refiner's fire. He's refining his people. He's not coming back at that time as a warrior for the church. He's coming back for his people of Israel. He'll be knocking on the door, and I think all hope is lost, right? And the Messiah is coming. And the blood's going to flow to the bridles of the horses. He's going to do it on his own. He doesn't need help. We've proven that. Hezekiah has seen it in his day. 185,000 in one night, done. All living, breathing souls, God created, wiped them out. Unbelievers in the God of Israel. He already knows their hearts. He knows your heart. Jeremiah 31. More of his preservation of the people. That's where the Lord led me in this. Is lifting up Israel, his people, and how he preserved them. His del the deliverer, our great deliverer, our Messiah, but all the deliverers as we go through the book of Judges that he's put through his people that are faithful. And he's merciful because they repented. They turned from their wicked ways and sought him off. Jeremiah 31, 34 to 37. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, I will remember their sin no more. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, which delivereth, divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all they have done, saith the Lord. The psalm text, I'll have you read through those on your own. It's more preservation, his deliverance. It's all, he's all about delivering. That's where he gets joy. He's delivering us from our, our heartaches, our bondages, our sin, our chains. He loves delivering people. And he used one great person in our lives. The sign of the covenant that he showed us is Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah, Jesus. That's the deliverer of all time. The disciples didn't quite have it right. They weren't being taught representatives in their life we're being taught really exactly who the we will be, right? They're going to free us from oppression, from the world, from the governments, the Roman government at the time. And when he died, he perished. We're like, oh. They hid in a room. He ascended. He walked on the road. The Emmaus is a great story. Luke 24. That's one of them that woke me up last week. <laughs> Sticking to the word of God and not doctoring it up. He taught who he would be through the 22 books of the Hebrew Bible. He pointed it out. This is he. This is he. Yet he covered their eyes. He blinded them to knowing who he was until he broke bread. And then their amazement. Did our hearts not melt within us as he walked with us and talked with us? Let him walk and talk with you every day. We need it. We need it to see the Jesus always. And all this other stuff, the baloney out there, that's Greek. <laughs> all that stuff out there is nothing we need those trials, we do we actually need those trials like I said, those psalm references I think I have them on the text sheet check those out you see the deliverance that God orchestrated the sovereign plan of history Mordecai was also a tribe of Benjamin as we read Ehud his grandparents taken captive this also a God's judging hand upon his people Israel due to lack of unwillingness to repent of their ways. 
Yeah, we're blessed to have the entirety of Scripture before us and know God, know that God has and will preserve remnant unto himself. Isaiah 41, 8 through 11. We have a historical fact that Israel was established in a day. Being the old city of Jerusalem, experienced agriculture, development, be hated by all nations, including this nation. There's a long list. You want to write them down. Deuteronomy 33, Isaiah 35, 10, Isaiah 43, 5, Isaiah 51, 11, Jeremiah 30, 1 through 2, Jeremiah 30, 30, or 32, 37 through 42, Ezekiel 36, the list goes on. It's the second largest topic in the book. Israel's mentioned like 2,500 and some times in the Bible, other than our, our Lord himself. It's like the second most mentioned thing in the Bible. To know his faithfulness, we have to honor them. We'll bless those who bless him, right? His faithful, he is faithful to his promises and covenants. He has preserved his people for over 2,700 years, looking back to the exile I mentioned. Back to the text, we have to take note that the Lord is doing works in kings, nations, individuals. This is also the first record instance that an invading army came into the land after Joshua crossed the Jordan with the people. This is the first time he came into that same area, the city of Palms, just outside or in Jericho, that area. They're in the land, they're attacking. So God's bringing them in. He's using them as an anchor. And for how long? The land that God promised the people, if they would obey and follow them wholeheartedly, as in Deuteronomy 8, he would bless them. Also, for the power of the Lord through his spirit, um, those who had faith in the Lord God of Israel, great works and mighty deeds are accomplished to do God's bidding. In war with Othniel, sword with Ehud, or even farm implement with Shamgar. And these men had wisdom to judge and discern God's people for multiple years of reprieve. At times we get blinded in our slavery. First they had eight years of slavery. Then they returned to their sinful ways. And then they had another 18 years of bondage. This can show us a parallel in a person's life who remains in sin. It can go on and on, even after many attempts of others to counsel, admonish, exhort, encourage, get them to repent and acknowledge their dependency upon the Lord Jesus in all of life's issues. Not some, all. Priority. At times, some may give up or lose hope in redirecting a person out of sin's grasp. It gets tiring. Especially when it's within the brethren. Many opportunities and chances, there's no change, no remorse, no change of heart. The professing but not possessing. Being at the end of ourselves is where he wants us to be. Looking up, he uses all that junk, that baloney, to reveal his power and receive all the glory from those that repent and turn from their evil ways at any moment. At any time. Praise God for his mercy and love, where in which I stand. And maybe you do too. Some of you may be worrying more than you should. Still knowing God is in control, yet you can't stop worrying. Some of you may have depression, discouragement, hostility towards others, you might harbor bitterness. Childhood issues and rearing its ugly head yet after years and years and years. On and on, day by day, we wish we could stop those sinful habits, and you can. There lies good news. Give it unto the Lord. He tells us he is willing. He is able to pardon. He can do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we can ask and think. He will deliver you out of any and all things. He has given us the deliverer to carry the heavy burdens and loads our Lord Jesus Christ is ready and waiting for you to come to the end of yourself and myself abiding in him is for his service and being victorious in battles for this life to turn this day wholeheartedly and seek his face he will lift you up he will heal the broken hearted 
And I will say that these promises don't only apply to individuals, but the church as a whole. I think we talk a good game, but really don't really hand over the reins to Jesus as believers. Losing sight of what he deems important and what our view is important is different a lot of times. 1 Corinthians 1, please turn there. It's a message of hope for us, us that uh, think, well, how can you use me? Does he want to use me? Are you willing to be used is the key. Time, treasure, and talents. Time is the big thing. Get plugged in. Some ministry, serve the Lord somewhere in your family. This, you don't have to be a bishop. <laughs> serve him. He's going to bless you. You get another pair of socks. Bless your socks. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 1.26 31. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen, chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised that God has chosen and the things that are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That as it is written, he who glories let him glory in the Lord. Amen. Two things wrong with us, not us. There's two things. God judges us by the basis of our faithfulness and what he has given us. That's one. Number two, what we sometimes think is essential isn't essential to God. Moving in the direction of what we view as progress and asking God to bless the works of our hands later. Especially if we see favorable outcomes initially, like the children of Israel. We're on the right path, but we're not seeking the Lord anymore. We're going on our own road. We're not waiting on the Lord anymore. He's giving you a little bit of uh, leeway to bring you to the end of yourself again. It's a hard fall. That's what he likes. It's a soft fall. We still rely on ourselves a little bit. God's, Judah's lack of following God's command to go and fight the Canaanites, we mentioned earlier, Alone, he did not follow. Yes, Simeon they ate in the fight. Yet progress appeared at first and then declined in victories because they went in on their own power eventually. A slippery slope. Compromise. No representatives in their families. No one to take a stand. The faithful did one person. And then the nation followed. <laughs> Can be so gradual at first, but a decline of which we have to climb later to meet the Lord slippery slope. We always have to turn back and climb. Not by works, but of humbleness and dependency on the Lord. Now, in Chandra's uh, brief entry, we have to see that the Spirit of God was upon him. As I mentioned earlier about the gladiators and how they would defend a 16 square foot area. Superbly trained to the death. For 54 foes or so. There's a guy using a farm implement to take care of 600. God's hand was on him. God be the glory in Israel had been delivered again at the end of Chamber's uh, judgment, judging. Only the hand of the merciful God and the God of Israel can all these things happen. So we read bring conclusion here. God loves to, uh, to deliver us as vessels. We are faithful and willing to trust him. He's willing to do it. To bless those who want to take faith in him on our own efforts, uses what we may see as insignificant to signify his great power and sovereignty. Nothing's too small for the Lord. He uses those things. Love, his love for his people and discipline and preservation. He shows us that through history, course in history, he shows us that in prophetic word. 
and shown through his faithfulness unto his people Israel. We have to view it. We have to look at Israel, what he's done with his people. Our children, a chosen vessel unto him, apple of his eye. Yeah, I mean, you, you can look at it, actually, there would be two races, or Gentile or Jew, really. God made Jew out of Gentiles out of nothing. But we're all one heart. We can only accept it into God's kingdom through the blood of the Messiah. You are never. His faithfulness, all the Old Testament saints, all their faithfulness on his promises. A lot of them went to death. Most of them <laughs> went to their death, believing in the faith of our Lord Jesus. Or the faith of God's promise of the Lamb. Or God's promise of the Messiah. It's all God's promises. That's what we have to rest in. Thank you for your patience. Um, if anybody's interested, I have the article on Dale Moody. Um, I did cut it down from length, but it's going to take a little long. So I won't hold you here any longer tonight. You've been very patient. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. May you just uh, work a work in our hearts through it to gain understanding of who you are and who we should be daily, to honor you, to give you glory in all things more of you and less of us, to love the brethren, to put aside all those bitterness things, all those things that junk that baloney in our lives, Lord, we just ask that you would help acknowledge those things in our lives, to come to the end of ourselves, to turn to you. Lord, you're willing. You sent your son to die. You separated yourself from him. In a moment of time to take the world's sin upon his shoulders, he is more than capable. There's no works that can do it. There's nothing we can do to earn salvation. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It is by grace that we are saved through faith. Those things that you tell us, those promises, we have to hold dear to us. And when we hold dear and understand those things in our lives, to know that we are justified. And I'm going to go to the extent to say we are sanctified. We are set apart as your people already. We have to be willing to be used by you. We can grow, Lord. You help us grow in the grace and knowledge of your son, Jesus. I'm not saying we don't, Lord. But you help us grow. Help us grow now in those things. To be used by you. You're just waiting for us. It can be few on this earth. 6% now in this nation alone believe that your word is inspired, the truth. 6% of the church believe who you are. And that Jesus is the only way. It is your only son, God of human flesh, who's died for us, bore our sins, raised from the dead, because death cannot hold him. He's sinless. His blood covers all. It takes away sin. He ascended at the Father. He's at your right hand now, Father, and we pray, and we allow us to enter your throne room through him. We just thank you for that opportunity, and may we be right before you so those prayers would be hearkened by you. Turn hearts tonight who would not know you, not know your precious Son, that's Lord and Savior. We're going to call your Son, Lord. We have to obey we're going to call him Savior. We have to worship him. Turn on us, Lord. In the blessed name of your son, Jesus, I pray. Amen.